All right, everyone. We are just past the noon hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, introducing our uh, exciting speaker uh, for our first lecture of the fall series of the Idaho Clinicians for Climate and Health and St. Luke's Climate and Health Lecture Series. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Stephanie Wicks, uh, my partner in everything sustainability at St. Luke's, uh, Michael Hobson and Sarah Hegerly, who have been helping us organize all of these events. Um, and let you guys know, we've got some upcoming lectures uh, next Wednesday featuring the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. And then on November 1st with Dr. Howard Frumkin uh, and November 15th with Dr. Garab Basu. Um, so exciting lectures. And if you registered for this one today, you should be able to find those lectures in the registration hub as well. Um, and now I have the great privilege to introduce a climate hero of mine, um, Dr. Catherine Hayo. Dr. Hayo is an accomplished atmospheric scientist who studies climate change and why it matters to us here and now. She is a remarkable communicator who has received the American Geophysical Union's Climate Communication Prize, the Stephen Schneider Climate Communication Award, and the United Nations Champion of the Earth Award. She has been named to a number of lists, including the Time Magazine, 100 Most Influential People, Foreign Policies, 100 Leading Thinkers, and Fortune Magazine's World Greatest Leaders, her TED Talk, The Most Important Things You Can Do to Fight Climate Change is Talk About It, has more than 4 million views, and her most recent book, Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. Catherine has served as the Chief Scientist for the Nature Conservancy and uh, the Paul W. Horn Distinguished Professor and Political Science Endowed Professor in Public Policy and Public Law at Texas Tech University. She has a uh, Bachelor's in Science from uh, the University of Toronto, and an MS and PhD in Atmospheric Science from the U University of Illinois. She's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Scientific Affiliation, and has been awarded honorary doctorates from Colgate University, Trinity College, and Victoria University, uh, and the Wycliffe U College at the University of Toronto. It is my great privilege to introduce Dr. Catherine Hale. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I realized that was that was quite a Catherine, tongue twister. You're muted, we can't hear you. Oh, I am not muted. Not muted. Okay. I am not muted here. Um, we have lost our try again. I'll keep, there you I'll go. keep talking. Okay. You can hear me now. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, good. All right. Um, I apologize for that introduction. That is a huge tongue twister, um, <laughs> but you got through it all. Um, what's really important, though, is that I am someone who cares about climate change, and I'm also convinced that you are too. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you live, what you do, because there is some way that climate change is already affecting the people you love, the places you love, the things you love. And that is true of everyone around you, whether they realize it or not. So I'm really delighted to be here to kick off the first in a series of really amazing, phenomenal talks that you have coming. I looked down the list of who's already spoken to you and who's coming up in the future, and my goodness, you have an incredible list. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, physically, but you are getting the best of the best in terms of just going through the thought leaders on how climate and health relate to each other. And if you've been to these before, you've probably heard, and I just want to reiterate, that talking about health is one of the biggest ways to open a door to a positive, constructive conversation about climate change, because health is something that relates directly to everybody. You know, if you like fishing, not everybody fishes. Um, if you're a parent, and that's why you care about climate change, not everybody's a parent, but everybody cares about their health. So you have the door into that. So what I want to do is I want to make this a bit of a two way conversation. So let me just share my screen with you here. Um, here we go. And if you don't mind, take out your phone. I know that's kind of unusual to say take out your phone. You can go ahead and turn the ringer off while you're taking it out. Take out your phone and go to pollev.com slash Catherine, or just take a picture of this QR code with your camera, and it'll take you right to the website. If it asks for your name, don't worry about that. Just push the skip button, and you can just keep on going. Um, and then once you're there, I want to ask you a couple of questions and then you can ask me questions as we go along. So once you're there, the first question I have for you is, um, oops, there we go. Have you attended the other climate talks? I want to know. Oh, wow. We got a lot of people who've been to all of them. That's awesome. Okay. Many of them. Oh, and there's a ton of people who this is their first. Okay. Let's see. So it looks like about half of people, this is your first. 
That's great. Welcome. And please don't make it your last because you have some amazing speakers coming up. Um, a few people have been to all of them. Um, some people have been to many of them, but 20%. And then a few people have been to one or two. Okay. That is great. I just wanted to know in terms of how much information have you already heard about the relationship between climate and health? Now I want to ask you a different question. And this is a difficult question. Um, and you have to answer it with just one word, any word, but only one word. And the question is this, when I say climate change, how do you feel? Just one word. When I say climate change, how do you feel? Anxious, scared, nervous, depressed, intimidated, helpless, overwhelmed, dread, yes. You know what? If I took these results and I looked at them later, I wouldn't be able to tell if they came from you, if they came from the architects I spoke with a little while ago, if they came from the high school talk I gave a couple of weeks before that, if they came from the Catholic nuns that I spoke to a few weeks before that, or they came from the business people in the food industry I spoke to before that. Wherever, whoever I've spoken to over the last couple of years, ever since I first, the first time I ever asked this question was the first time right after my book came out, Saving Us. And the reason I wrote my book is because the number one question I get from people is what gives you hope? And so I started to say, well, how do you feel about this? And this is exactly how most of us feel. So as I go along, you can use this tool at any point to ask me questions and to upvote the questions you most want me to answer. And I'll remind you as we go along, I'm just gonna leave this open. But I wanna start by saying, if you feel anxious, scared, worried, or depressed, angry, frustrated, panicked, you are not alone. The majority of people feel like that. And not only that, that is a logical and reasonable response to the situation we're in. When I look at what's happening to this world, and that's what I do, I'm a climate scientist, I see that we are conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home we have. As far back as we can go in human history, we have never seen climate changing this fast. As far back as we can go in the whole history of the planet, we have never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. So this makes me feel scared. Why wouldn't it? This is our home and we are conducting a very unprecedented and unsafe experiment with it. We've known about this for a really long time. It was the 1850s, not the 1950s, the 1850s, when scientists realized that digging up and burning coal and gas and oil was producing heat trapping gases that were building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, causing it to run a fever. That is literally what is happening. Just as you would if someone snuck into your room at night and put an extra blanket on you, you'd wake up sweating saying, hey, I didn't need this blanket. In the same way, we're wrapping an extra blanket around the planet and it's running a fever. Did you know that the temperature of the planet, global average temperature over the history of human civilization is as stable as that of the human body? That's right, over the course of a day, as you know, our body temperature goes up and down by a few tenths of a degree. That's natural and that's normal. Over the course of human civilization, the temperature of our planet went up and down by a few tenths of a degree. That's normal and that's natural. But now it's running a fever of almost two degrees Fahrenheit. How do you feel if you have a fever of two degrees Fahrenheit? You feel achy, take some Tylenol, you start you know, checking out who you were exposed to and what you might have. That's the situation that we're in today. And why does this matter? Just like a fever affects your body function in the same way when the planet's running a fever, it affects the function of every aspect of society and nature on this planet. It affects the quantity and the quality of the water that we drink. It is affecting quite literally the air that we breathe. It is affecting the food that we eat. It's affecting the buildings and roads and systems that we use that were all built for a planet that no longer exists. And when it comes to health, and this is what a lot of what you've already heard and we'll be hearing we'll talk about, there are at least eight different ways that climate change is affecting our health. 
Now, the most obvious one, actually, let me pause here. Try to count to yourself. How many can you think of? How many can you think of? Okay. The most obvious one is extreme heat. We know that extreme heat kills more people than just about any other extreme. In the United States at this moment, there's still a little bit more deaths from cold than from heat, but that's going this direction. And around the world, individual heat waves kill tens of thousands of people at the same time. But it's not just about heat. We know that the hotter it gets, the worse our air pollution gets because the chemical reactions that turn tailpipe emissions into dangerous ground level ozone happen faster in hotter temperatures. We also know that as CO2 in the atmosphere is rising, plants like ragweed have a longer season and they're producing more allergens. But then there's the severe weather disasters like the terrible flooding in Libya that has killed thousands of people. Weather disasters directly impact people in the immediate moment, but they also indirectly affect people for much longer. Like how? Like mold growth or the fact that a toxic um, Superfund site got flooded and all of those toxins flowed into people's homes, but the cancer rates don't spike until five or 10 years later, or the PTSD from your community being destroyed and being made homeless. Then there's the fact that increasing heavy precipitation events is increasing the risk of water contamination. Waterborne disease is a major killer, especially in low-income countries, but even in some areas right here in the United States, especially for children under the age of five. Then there's a spread of vector-borne diseases. Now, by vector, I don't mean arrow. <laughs> it's a technical term, of course. It means by a carrier species, um, typically mosquitoes or ticks, sometimes rats or mice. The boundary of where these species can live and carry the disease is spreading poleward. And so we're seeing that diseases that used to be tropical are moving poleward. Their range is expanding as it gets warmer. So we're up to five so far, but we still have three more to go. Climate change is also impacting our mental health. Eco-anxiety was officially um, added to the dictionary back in 2019. It was in fact the word of the year for the dictionary that year. And many, many people, especially young people, are suffering from even crippling mental health issues related to or exacerbated by the climate crisis. Did you know also that the more CO2 we have in our atmosphere, the faster plants grow, but if they have the same amount of nutrition, then you might get a bigger eggplant or squash, but it has less nutritional content. So the nutrition of food is decreasing and it doesn't matter so much for people who have access to plentiful food and nutrients and vitamins and all that, but for many people who don't, it means that malnutrition is on the rise, thanks to climate change. And all of these are serious don't get me wrong, but there's one more that, in my opinion, is even bigger. What is that. It's the fact that climate change is increasing the risk of conflict and refugee crises. How is that a health crisis? Well, when people lose their homes, when people have to flee because of conflict, when people are packed into refugee camps, what's the first thing that goes? Health, basic health care. All of a sudden, having a baby becomes a life-threatening condition. Stepping on a rusty nail becomes a life-threatening condition. Contracting some type of disease, which would be easily solvable with modern medicine, becomes a life-threatening condition, not to mention lack of access to clean water, massive amounts of water pollution, uh, no sanitation facilities, lack of adequate food and nutrition. All of these are compounded when people don't have those structures in place, a safe place to live, running water, access to food, and very, very basic health care. When we look at this issue, it isn't about saving the planet. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It is quite literally about saving us. We are the ones who are at risk from this issue. And so that's why I called my book Saving Us, in case you're wondering. So what, why does climate change such an overarching issue? Well, another way to think about it is this. I think of climate change not as a separate bucket where I care about people's health and their well being and their physical safety. Oh, and also I care about climate change. Climate change is not a separate bucket. 
climate change is the hole in every bucket. If you care about poverty, inequity, gender or racial equity, if you care about health, infectious diseases, healthy lifestyles, if you care about public health, whatever it is you care about, climate change is a hole in the bucket, making it worse. If we don't fix it, it will fix us. So this is actually very liberating because it means that we don't have to convince everyone to care for the same reason we do. We don't have to make people care because, you know, I care because I care about infectious disease, so you should care for that same reason. And we don't have to be coercing people into acting as if they don't have any reason to act other than how others see them. No, whoever we are, whatever we care about, if we're a human being living on this planet who wants clean air to breathe and clean water to drink, if we are someone who cares about our kids or birding, or we're a Rotary Club member, or we're a person of faith, Whoever we are, we're already the perfect person to care about and act on climate change. And if someone else doesn't realize it, it's our job to help them connect the dots. Now, as you go along, don't forget, you can enter your questions at any point in Poll Everywhere. It is P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash Catherine. You have to spell it right, K-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-E. Or it's just that QR code that you had at the beginning. So that's how we're collecting questions. And we're not only collecting questions, you can upvote the questions you most want answered. So what does this mean? This means something that social workers often say, and it's a perfect analogy. There's no wrong door. There is no wrong door to care about climate action. So where do we start the conversations with people? Not with what divides us, but rather with what unites us, what we have in common. Begin your conversations with something that we share. We both live in the same place. We both have kids in the same school. We both walk our dogs together to the same park. We both play in the same rec sports league. We both come from the same other place or other country or other state. We both come from the same faith tradition. We're both members of the Rotary Club or the Kiwanis Club. We both graduated from the same school or attend the same school. We both, I started conversations on how we both knit we both enjoy wine. We both like beach vacations. Start with what we have in common. Connect the dots to how climate change is affecting the people, places, things that we already love. Explain that and then bring in positive, constructive solutions that can make a difference because you want to take people from here to here. So explaining how climate change matters, the risks, what's at risk if we don't act, takes people from here to here. But everybody in the world could be up here. And if they don't know what to do, we're never going to move. We're never going to budge. We want to get people from here to here. And that's the second half. We have to talk about positive, constructive solutions. So here are the two most frequent questions I get. And here is why I wrote Saving Us to answer these two questions. Question number one, how do I talk to fill in the blank about this? How do I talk to them about that? Well, first of all, I want to highlight something very important. Often when I say we need to be having conversations, your mind immediately jumps to Uncle Jim. Now, your uncle might not be called Jim. Mine isn't either. But you know somebody in your life, a neighbor, a colleague, somebody you know who is just obsessed with proving that this isn't real. They're always posting online about how scientists are making this up. You know, they're saying that green energy is just a scam to fill people's pockets. That is not the person I'm very sorry to say that we can have positive, constructive conversations with. Why? Because they literally can't listen. They literally cannot listen or click on a link online or read or understand anything you share because they view it as too great a threat to their identity. That's the bad news. Here's the good news though. They are only 10% of the population. People who are dismissive, who will dismiss 200 years of climate science, 2,000 climate scientists, 2 million scientific studies are 10% of the population. Everybody else, we absolutely can, and here's how. So the second assumption we often make, beyond the assumption that we need to talk to the 10%, I say, no, we need to talk to the 90%. Then we say, okay, but most people aren't worried. There's me and everybody in this room, and we're mostly worried, right? I was glad to see there was a few people who are hopeful, which is awesome. I am also hopeful due to the reasons I will explain here. But at the same time, I'm worried. And we think, well, here we are, we're worried, but nobody else is because they don't talk about it. 
So if they aren't worried, what do we have to do? If they just knew how bad it was, then surely they would spring into action, we think, right? So climate changes and we get worried and what do we do? We share more scary information, right? We want people to wake up and get worried. But here's the thing, it isn't motivating more action. In fact, people are rejecting it even more and we're seeing even more in action. And I saw this this summer. This summer, I saw so many people saying, if the Maui wildfires, if the Northwest Territory wildfires, if the crazy heat, if this doesn't convince people to act, nothing will. And I said, if they're already worried and they don't know what to do, it won't. But then people thought, well, there's nothing else we can do. There is. But we have to realize this is not motivating most people. And the reason why is because of the way our brains are wired. Tally Sherrod is not a climate scientist. She is a neuroscientist. And she wrote a fascinating book called The Influential Mind. And in it, she says, and she's not talking about climate change. She's just talking about the way our brains are wired. She says, fear and anxiety will cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. That's the way our brains are wired, yet we go on dumping more and more and more fear on people, expecting somehow it will give a different result. That is not the way our brains are wired. Fear plays a role, but it plays a role to wake us up. Then what? It gets us from here to here. Then what? Well, let's go back to this assumption that we make. We assume, well, Nobody wants to talk about it, so they're not worried, but there's just a small group of us that are worried, so we have to make more people worried. When we look at the polling data, this isn't what people look like. People don't look like this. What do they look like? This. This is what people look like, according to polling data. There's a small group who claim they're not worried, the 10% dismissives I talked about before, and a few others who I think probably are worried, they're just suppressing it so hard they won't admit it. Then three quarters of people in the US are worried. Three quarters of people. But here's the challenge. How many are activated? 8%. 8% are activated. 75% are worried. 8% are activated. What's the most important thing for us to do? Move people from worry to activated. And to move people from worried to activated, it is very different than moving people from not worried to worried. What do we have to do? Well, this is the way people feel. Before, two years ago, 70% were worried. Now we're at 75, but 50% feel hopeless, helpless, and don't know where to start. And like I said, only 8% are activated. What are the challenges holding us back? It isn't the head. It's not everything. We, we know that climate change is real. We know it's serious. We know it's supersizing weather, extreme weather events around the world. We know all that up here. But we have to connect and help other people connect their head to their heart. We have to show why it matters to you because of who you already are and what you already care about. And then we have to connect the heart to the hands. What can I do to make a difference? Because most people will say, I have no idea. So this, this head to the heart issue actually has a name. It's called psychological distance. And it's the idea that we humans are really good at pushing our problems off into the distant future, right? Oh, that doesn't matter now. I'll worry about it later. Let me have that extra donut now. I'll worry about my arteries later, right? Or it's distant in space. That just happens to those people over there, not me here. Or it's abstract, you know, global average temperature rather than what's happening in my life. Or it doesn't matter to me. I'm just not that type of person. What does this look like? So I'm going to show you some actual data that illustrates psychological distance. This comes from the Yale program on climate communication. And I have highlighted the county that Boise is in. So you can see how you compare to the rest of the state and the country. So Is global warming real? Two years ago, 72% of people in your county would have said yes. And that's what most people around the US say. And these numbers are higher today, about 75%. So it's real, sure. Will it affect plants and animals? 
Where's the psychological distance there? In relevance, non-human species. Sure, plants and animals, yes. How about future generations? That's distant in time, right? In the future, not now. Yeah, future generations. How about people who live in developing countries? That's people who live over there, not here. Yeah, largely, yes. And then the researchers ask this question, will it affect you? Look at this. All of a sudden, the numbers plummet. Will it affect you? People say, no, this is psychological distance. Now, let me stop here. It's not even a question of whether it'll affect you. It already is affecting people. I live in Texas where climate change is supersizing our hurricanes, not will, is. I live in Texas where it is making our rainfall more variable and that's affecting our water resources and our agriculture, not will, is. I live in Texas where it's making it hotter, threatening public health, water supply, infrastructure, not will, is. Where do you live? You live in Idaho, where climate change is already decreasing your snowpack. Not will, but is. It's already happening. This is affecting your water resources. All those red dots there, those are all um, snow observation stations. And if the dot is blue, they're getting more snow now than they used to. And if it's red, they're getting less. And the bigger the, the dot, the less snow they're getting. That's a lot of red dots. Look at the bogus basin ski season. It's going one way downhill, the wrong way. Less seasons or less uh, ski uh, days. What about wildfires? We're seeing that wildfires are burning greater and greater area the hotter it gets. The city of Boise itself is the second fastest warming city in the United States. Second fastest warming. And these wildfires, of course, affect air quality as well as affecting ecosystems. And then it affects the economy. There's been great analyses in Idaho about how climate change is affecting every aspect of Idaho's economy, energy, infrastructure, agriculture, water, and more. So often we think, well, my priority list is I worry about the people I love, I worry about feeding my family, keeping up with my job, paying the bills, planning for the future, protecting the place I live, you know, maybe down at 29, I've got doing something about climate change. And now here I am in this talk and she's saying it's really important. And so maybe I need to move it up to maybe number eight or seven or even six. You know what? I don't think climate change needs to be on our priority list at all. Take it off entirely. Why? Because why do I care about climate change? I care about it because it affects everything that's already on my list. I care about it because it affects our health, everyone I love, the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the people's jobs and well-being, the economy and paying the bills, the future. It isn't a matter of prioritizing this issue. It's a matter of connecting the dots to help people see that who they already are is the perfect person to care. And that's very different than trying to make them care about it for the same reason you do. Again, there's no wrong door. We just have to figure out what people's door is. And we have to talk about this in a way that is relevant, a way that shows that to care about climate change, you don't have to be a certain type of person. You literally just have to be a human. And if you're living in Idaho, it helps because look at all the ways that your life is being affected in Idaho today. So when we talk about climate change, we need to bring it here, not over there now not in the future make it concrete what's happening that you can see not sort of global average temperature or ice sheets off in greenland and we have to talk about it in a way that's relevant to whoever you're talking with whether it impacts their health their life their well-being that of their child the integrity of their home the economy the place they work or live or study make it close that would overcome barrier number one but there's two barriers and all the disasters we saw this summer definitely addressed barrier number one, but they didn't address barrier number two. In fact, over this summer, I personally have seen barrier number two increasing rather than decreasing. 
What is barrier number two? Barrier number two is lack of efficacy. Efficacy is a very social science -y word, but it has a simple meaning. It means if I do something, will it make a difference? And then there's collective efficacy. If we do something, can it make a difference? People are willing to act if they think what they do will make a difference. And what we have seen this summer is a crippling lack of efficacy. We have seen efficacy plummet as psychological distance decreases, which is good, we are seeing efficacy go down because people don't see how they could stop the wildfires or the heat waves or the floods. And so when we communicate and when we talk about this issue, it is absolutely essential to not give just the first half. We have to give the second half. Otherwise you have more and more people worried and they're paralyzed and they don't know what to do. So how do we address the second half? How do we help to build efficacy. It turns out that there's something very simple that we can do that begins to tackle this. Now, there's no one thing that will fix the whole problem, right? But there's a step that is so simple that we often skip right over it. We take it for granted. We just assume that that's happening. And when we look at these maps, it turns out it's not. So this is where we left off. This is the last map you saw. Um, do you think climate change affects you? And you can see across most of the country, it's blue, including where I live and where you live, it's blue. But then the researchers asked people one more question. And the answer to this next question was darker blue. Yes, there was a question that was darker blue than this. And you know what that was? Do you ever talk about it? Do you ever talk about it? And it turns out the answer is mostly no. And if you do talk about it, but all you're doing is more fear-based messaging and you're not talking about how it matters here and now, what solutions look like, then that's not gonna help. People aren't talking about it. So as crazy as it sounds, the first step to tackling these two barriers is simply to be having these conversations everywhere in our family, in the grocery store, and especially where we work about what? About connecting the head to the heart, how climate change is affecting us, and connecting the heart to the hands, what we can do to fix it. Now, at this point, I was talking to a group in Iowa last year, and they said, okay, well, so we understand that climate change affects our water and our food, the safety of our homes, our economy, and our health. But I just want to know, how do we talk about the polar bears effectively? How do we do that? And I said, well, unless there's a secret population of polar bears in Iowa that I've never heard about, you don't. You want to talk about your family in Arizona with my colleague, Joellen here, who is an oceanographer. She has to wake her precious kids up before dawn in the summer because that's the only time that they can go outside to play safely. You talk about that if you live somewhere hot. What about if you live somewhere that floods? You talk about what happened to your house or the house of the people you know and how devastating those floods were on their health and well being in their homes. What if you live somewhere like me in Texas? I talk about cotton and the impact of drought and heat on cotton with Jack, who says that he hasn't seen a decent crop since 2005. What if you live somewhere where there's drought? That's what you talk about. Talk about how climate change affects us, but don't stop there. That's only half the story. We have to talk about what we can do to fix it. And so this is something that I think is so important that if you go to my Twitter account, if you go to my Instagram account, there is a pinned post at the top of all my accounts. And this is what the pinned post says. It says, if you're worried about climate change and you want to make a difference, here's what you can do. Number one, start a conversation about why it matters and how you can make a difference. Number two, join a group that shares your values and on my website which is just my name katherinehayhoe.com i have a list of groups i have a list of groups for winter athletes and parents and people of faith and business people and healthcare professionals join a group to amplify your voice 
make your money count speak with your money in terms of where you what bank you use what credit card you use where you invest your retirement funds or if you don't have a choice then use your voice to advocate for changing how they, they invest your retirement funds use your voice to spark ideas at work and school of how we can change together use your voice to hold politicians accountable and yes make changes in your personal life to reduce your personal carbon footprint. I do that myself. And that's a big part of why I'm not speaking to you in person. I give over 90% of my talks virtually and I only fly when I can bundle enough uh, events together to make that carbon really worthwhile. I'm going to be heading to New York City next week for climate week and I've bundled so successfully at this point that I'm not quite sure I'm going to be able to sleep. I have 27 events in four days. But I'm going to tell you, the carbon of each event is minimal. <laughs> so do what you can to reduce your footprint, but do not ever stop there. Talk about it. Hey, you wouldn't believe how my power bill went down when we switched out our light bulbs. Hey, I love the new plug-in car we got. It's awesome. Look how much money we're saving. Hey, I made, I made chili without meat the other day, and it was delicious, and it cost a lot less money too. Hey, we've been reducing our leftovers. Hey, we've been doing this, and here's how great it is. There's so much that we can do to make a difference. And it isn't just about us. I love sharing stories about how countries are acting and making a difference all over the world. I love sharing stories about how corporations are making a difference. Corporations often that you wouldn't think of, not only the Patagonias of the world. One of my favorite uh, corporation stories is a carpet company who figured out how to make carbon negative carpet. In other words, more carbon was taken out of the atmosphere when producing their carpet than was produced. And so their carpet salespeople are now climate heroes because they're helping take carbon out of the atmosphere. That is just phenomenal story to share. I love how communities, churches, army bases are taking action. And I love how these actions can save money. The faster we decarbonize, the more money we save as much as $12 trillion worldwide. Nature-based solutions could yield four trillion in economic value. Nature-based markets are valued at seven trillion. When we address climate change, we also, these are the horrible side effects, we also get cleaner air and water because one in six deaths is due to pollution and most of that pollution is coming from fossil fuels and industrial practices that produce heat trapping gases too. We also help build climate resilience, protecting people from disasters like storms, wildfires and floods. We improve people's physical and mental health. We provide more, not less affordable energy. We reduce inequalities. We create healthy ecosystems and healthy food systems. We build a more stable world. Oh, and we tackle climate change too. And so that's why young people are speaking out. That's why our own lives and the way we live are changing. The way we eat, the way we travel, the way we get our energy. The world is changing. The International Energy Agency estimates that by 2025, which is in two and a half years, half the electricity in the world will be generated from renewable sources. Half. The world is changing so fast, we can't keep up. So that giant boulder of climate action that we feel like is at the bottom of a cliff with only a few hands on it, you know, maybe Greta Thunberg, maybe Sir David Attenborough, maybe Al Gore, we feel like, and then we feel like, look, if I add my hand, it won't budge. So why bother? When we look around, we realize that giant boulder is already at the top of the hill. It is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It already has millions of hands on it. And because it's already moving, if I add mine, and if I use my voice to encourage others to add theirs, you know what? It'll go faster. So that gives you the answer to the second question I get, but let me just touch on this briefly and then I'm gonna be turning to your questions. So don't forget if you have questions, pollev.com slash Catherine, put your questions in and upvote the ones you want me to get to. I don't know if I'll be able to get to all of them, but the second question I get, and the second reason I wrote my book, Saving Us is, to answer the question, what gives you hope? Now, I don't find a lot of hope from looking at the disasters and the tragedies that are all around us that are being reported in the news every day. That does not give me hope. I also don't find my hope from wishful thinking. I don't know if you read this book when you were little, I did, and it really annoyed me. It is not about positive thinking. 
we could think positively until the world goes to hell in a handbasket, and that would make no difference on climate change. It is not about imitating the mythical proverbial ostrich. Ostriches don't really do this and bury our head in the sand and just hoping it'll just go away. That is not hope. What is hope? Hope begins with recognizing it's bad and it's getting worse. That's, that, that's where we have to start. Success is not inevitable or even entirely probable but there is a better future and there is a path from A to B on how to get there. And this is literally what the social science says about hope. There has to be a vision of a better future that contrasts with where we are today, which is not a good place. You don't need hope when you're in a good place, right? You need it when you're in a not good place. So we're starting from a not great place. There is a better future we can get to. There's a path from A to B and there is something that I and you can do to move us along that path. That is what hope is. And how do we start? How do we begin? Well, as George Marshall says, who wrote a great book called Don't Even Think About It, How Your Brain is Wired to Ignore Climate Change. He said, what you choose to discuss with your friends and family helps them understand what is important to your community. Talk is the fertile field in which cultural change begins. In its absence, people can't solve a problem. So how do we begin to work together? We begin by doing what that blue map showed us we're not, by having the conversations, because conversations underpin all climate action, where people invest their money, what party they vote for. And you know, 99.5% of elected officials are not federal. 995 are not federal yet so much action can happen at the local to regional level. What energy source people use at home? All these actions start with conversations. Having conversations about climate change in our daily lives plays a huge role in creating social change because we take our cues about what's important from what we hear. We walk around every day with a pair of antenna on our head, picking up what people around us are saying and modifying our lives and attitudes accordingly. And the goal of these conversations is not to lecture or hector or guilt or shame or pressure people. It is not. It is to bring people into the conversation and show them how they're already exactly who they are is the perfect person to care. Is this sufficient? Of course not. We need everything. There is no solution that's sufficient. Not just, there's no one solution that's sufficient. But this is the key to knocking over the first domino, getting the ball rolling, getting others to join in and add their hands. So when climate changes and we get worried, remember this from the beginning? What do you do? You know what not to do, right? What not to do, you don't load up your wheelbarrow of scary facts and dump it on people. That's not gonna work, but what do you do? Share information about connecting the head to the heart why it matters to me here and now, and then connect the heart to the hands. What are positive solutions that other hospitals have done that our hospital could do, that other towns have done that our town could do, that other universities have done that our university could do, that other families have done that our family could do, that other Girl Scout troops have done that our Girl Scout troop could do. What are positive solutions? And you know what? People feel empowered and that's when action results. Why? because that's the way our brains are wired. Let's go back to the neuroscience for a minute. Here's what Tally Sherratt says in that book she wrote called The Influential Mind. She says, the human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So if you, and again, she's not talking about climate change. She's talking about the human brain here. If you reframe whatever message you have, Climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious, we need to act now. Reframe that so the information you provide induces hope, not dread. That is how we get people to move. Isn't that amazing? It is so simple, yet it is so counterintuitive. And as Greta Thunberg says, there is this intimate relationship between hope and action. The one thing we need more than hope is action, why? Because once we start to act, hope is all around us. It is just amazing what can happen when people decide to do it. 
I'm often asked, do we need individual change or systemic change? And my answer to that is yes, because what is a system made up of other than individuals? And how does the system change other than when individuals call for that change? So I wanna close with some words that I wrote after the latest IPCC report came out telling us how bad things were. And I was reflecting on how we individuals could make a difference at the global scale. And I realized something really, really amazing that I'd never thought of before, and it's this. Change has never begun with the president, the prime minister, the CEO, the big wealthy famous person. Social change, to be specific. Change didn't begin when the King of England just woke up one morning and said, oh, let's just decide to end slavery. No, that didn't happen. The President of the United States didn't roll out of bed one morning and turn to his wife and say, oh dear, I really think we should give women the vote. That's not the way women got the vote. Apartheid did not end when the National Party of South Africa said, oh, it's Friday, let's just end apartheid. No, this change began, which we now live in today, when very ordinary people of no particular power or wealth or fame decided the world could and should be different. Who were William Wilberforce or Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela, and all the countless others who shared and supported and fought for their vision of a better world, whose names we can't recall today. They were people who were not rich or famous, but they simply had the courage of their convictions. And what did they do? They made changes in their personal life, yes. They did the equivalent of changing their light bulbs and driving the plug-in car, they did that. They didn't use sugar, for example, if they were abolitionists. But what else did they do that changed the world? They used their voice to advocate for the systemic societal changes needed. And what I realized is we, we're the people who changed the world before and we are the ones who can change it again. And when we realize that, my only question is, what are we waiting for? Let's do this thing. So before I go to your questions, I have one last question for you. Now that you know how you can make a difference, now that you know the power of a conversation, now that you know what's really holding people back is because they don't know what to do about this and we have answers to that. Now, how do you feel about climate change in just one word? If you lost the link, you can take a picture of the little QR code up there in the corner, or you can go to the link, which is pollev.com slash Catherine. And the reason why I'm asking for one word is because, as you can see, this is a word all. And the more people who say the word, the bigger the words. All right. I am liking these words. And you know what I like? I like to see determined. Is this easy? No, it is not easy. We have to be determined. Activated. We need to be active, not passive about this. Encouraged. Yes, we need daily, regular encouragement. I love ready, yes, we are ready. Look, if eight-year-old children can do this, and I've seen them do this very effectively, we can do this too, right? We will still have days when we feel discouraged, frustrated, and angry. I do, and you do too. That's normal, it's a rational response. But if we know that we can make a difference, that is how we can encourage more people to add their hand to that boulder. And so often people have asked me, I want more stories. What more positive stories can I tell people to help them understand that that giant boulder is rolling downhill and if they add their hand, it will go faster. So a year ago, what I did was I started a newsletter and the newsletter, oh, here's your questions here. Let me just go past this to the newsletter. Oops, why is this not working? Just a second here. So a year ago, I started a newsletter and here it is. Let me share this here. And every week I share good news, not so good news because we need to know what's happening and how it affects us and something that we can do about it. And I was afraid that I would run out of good news, but I've been doing this for a year now. And you know what? There is so much good news of people and organizations and companies and cities and more taking action that I am shoehorning two or three good news stories into every every uh, week now. This last week I was talking about sports teams that are taking action. Um, before that I was talking about uh, breweries that were taking action. There's action happening all around us. So if you're interested, just take a picture of that QR code. It'll take you right to the sign up page. And every week I share new things that we can use to start our conversation.
But let's go back now. Let's go back to those questions because we got a lot of questions here and people have been upvoting them, which is phenomenal. And we have 11 minutes to get to your questions. So let's do this. Should I just take this in order or do you want to pick and choose from them for me? I'm going to take that as an A. All right, let's do this. The number one thing you can do at home. This is a great question. So we are very wasteful with our energy and our food at home. And there are so many things that we can do to electrify our home, take fossil fuels out, reduce our energy consumption, um, be more efficient with our energy and our food. And so in my newsletter, I think a couple of weeks ago, I featured renew, uh, Rewiring America. Rewiring America has a phenomenal handbook on how to um, reduce your energy use and save money in your home and how to take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act subsidies in doing so. So the answer depends on everybody's because everybody's home is different, right? Like I lived in a historic home where the best thing I could do was roll out insulation in the attic and put plastic film on the windows, given my budget and the age of the home. Depending on where you live, the answer might be different for you, whether you live in an apartment or a house, whether it's older or newer, what you've already done, what needs to be done in the future. So there's many different things to do, but rewiring America, their handbook and their guide to how to use the Inflation Reduction Act to subsidize those actions is outstanding. Highly recommended. Um, ooh, I love this question. Should we be focused on individual actions or addressing businesses or industries who pollute? And you probably know what my answer is here. My answer is Yes. <laughs> what do I mean by that? I mean all of the above. It's not A, B, C, or D. We need to be doing it all. Taking personal action, but talking about it. Using our voice to call out businesses and industries. Using our money to invest positively in what we want to support and not to invest negatively in what we don't. We need system change. And for that system to change, we need all of the above. Like I said, in that pinned post I have at the top of my Instagram and the top of my Twitter accounts, use your voice and then use your money, use your voice again, amplify your voice by joining a group, make personal changes in your personal life and your home and always use your voice to amplify them and make them contagious. Okay, question number three. Um, what about the language that we use? Oh, I completely agree with you. Effective communication means we need to be using the right words. And I'm gonna take this off here so you can see me better, but we'll still, the questions are still here and you can still see the questions on your phone. Now, people often say, okay, so is there one phrase that if we just use this one phrase, that would just reach everybody? No, there isn't. Remember, there's no wrong door, but there's multiple doors. So for some people, climate change is, is great. They understand what it means. They you know, fully accept the science, let's move ahead. For others, climate crisis is more effective because it reminds them we are in a crisis here. We are in triage mode. For some people though, those terms cause them to just shut down because they're such politicized terms. So as I talk about in my book, I've given entire presentations where I've never mentioned the words climate and change together. And one story I tell in the book is how I gave a presentation um, to a group of water managers in Texas where I never said the words climate change together. And at the end, this woman came running up to me and she said, I agree with everything you said. It just makes sense. But those people who talk about global warming, I don't agree with them at all. And of course, I was, you know, sort of goggling at her because I've been talking all about it without mentioning those words. That's the power of using the right words. And so you'll notice that I often use the phrase global weirding to talk about climate change because wherever we live, things are getting weirder, whether it's heat or wildfire or flood or drought or storms, things are just getting different and they're getting weirder. But it is best practices always to speak in the language that people speak. So for example, when we're in the United States using Fahrenheit as opposed to Celsius, talking about the impacts that are local versus the ones that are distant. Always, always thinking about that psychological distance and trying to make sure that we use the language and the words that really bring the issue home to where people are at, rather than putting up barriers and dividing things by our language. 
All right, let me pause there. Um, any thoughts or questions, or did you want to ask a different question that wasn't on the list yet, or should we go back to the list? Uh, I think you should keep rolling with the questions from the list in the audience, because I could talk to you all day and ask you a million questions, but uh, I want to preserve the integrity of the polling and uh, let the, the audience speak. Okay. I mean, I love I, I do, I, let me Let me interject oh, yeah. for just one second, Catherine. I do want to suggest uh, two ways that people that are listening now can take the next step. Uh, one is that on Monday, the Idaho Clinicians for Climate and Health, um, our state-based organization of healthcare workers and caregivers, uh, are getting together at Lost Grove Brewing um, to have our fall social. So if you want to find out more about what you can do in your community of caregivers, come meet us at Lost Grove on Monday. And uh, our website, IdahoClinicians4ClimateAndHealth.org, has information all about it. Um, the second thing would be to continue coming to these lectures. Uh, not only does it give you a chance to hear other voices and speakers, but you know, if Catherine says the number one thing you can do in your home is to talk about electrifying your home, Dr. Basu, who's coming to speak to us on November 15th, will be talking about how he electrified his home as part of his lecture. Um, in January, we're gonna have people from Idaho Power uh, talk about incentives that are available to you locally um, and uh, contractors you can work with in your home to take advantage of some of the things that uh, are available through the Infl Inflation Reduction Act. So if you keep plugging away at these lectures, which are all recorded and posted on the St. Luke's uh, YouTube site, um, you can find out a lot more about these ways you can be uh, impactful in your own home. And now I wanna kick it back over to you, Catherine. That is phenomenal. Thank you so much. And that actually, I think, answers one of the questions, which is, you know, how can we get plugged in at the local or state level? That is so important. And like I said, I, so, if you can't already tell by the way I talk, I'm not American. And so I didn't know, being Canadian, that there's such a focus on national politics in the US. I didn't know that 99.5% of elected officials are not national. And that means that there is so much potential to reach out to candidates, to reach out to elected officials at the state level, the county level, the city level, and really have these meaningful conversations about the heart and the hands. Even if you're not using the words climate change, talking about what solutions look like, what impacts look like, and how we can work together for a better future. So are there some organizations that are doing a good job of this? Yes, there absolutely are. Um, climate Outreach was founded by George Marshall, who I quoted, and Climate Outreach has excellent resources, including a very nice guide called Talking Climate that I use in my classes to help students see how to have effective conversations about climate change. So Talking Climate by Climate Outreach. And then um, I co-founded an organization called Science Moms that's all about helping mothers and other parents, we're not exclusive to mothers, um, have effective conversations to advocate on behalf of their children, as well as having conversations with their kids. There's also great educational resources. Somebody asked about that. I have a YouTube series called Global Weirding that's often used in classrooms. NOAA has an excellent, N-O-A-A, -A, has an excellent educational program with lots of resources and NASA does too for kids. It's really difficult because state standards are changing and some of them are changing to require false information to be entered in our, in our classrooms. But it's really important to provide teachers with the resources. And I actually had a graduate student who graduated a couple of years ago, who was a former science teacher. And he surveyed hundreds of science teachers across the country to ask what was holding them back from including climate change in their curriculum. And this is in middle and high school. And he found that in most cases, they were not being held back by explicit requirements. They were being held back because they didn't have the time they didn't have the resources. They didn't feel like it was being prioritized by their school district, or maybe there would be some pushback from some parents or from some administrators. And so even just his conclusion was even just engaging with educators and teachers in your district and saying, how could I help? Could I help find resources for you? Could I help find activities or lesson plans? Um, what do you need? What could I provide? So the teachers don't have to have that added burden of trying to find the resources that they need when they're already overworked and underpaid. Both of my teacher, my parents are teachers, so I feel very strongly about that. Ask how you could help because a little bit can go a long way with education. And, um, ooh, 
lots of other oh my gosh there's too, way too many questions here uh, i have so many resources i've tried to collect on my website frequently asked questions videos talks other resources i would encourage you to check them all out and i often have resources related to questions you've had like um you know what what's clearing house for scientific answers or can you really explain the deal with flying which is a good one Flying produces a huge carbon footprint over just a couple of hours. That's why I think that people have focused so much on it. But what we have to do is we have to change both our culture of flying and we have to change the fuel that goes into the airplanes at the same time. It turns out that a small fraction of people produce the majority of emissions. It's the same with meat eating. 12% of people eat 50% of the meat in the country. <laughs> So there's this inequity in how we use our resources that flying and eating meat and other things like that really highlight. And it's part of how climate solutions need to be solutions for everyone, not just solutions for a few. And climate solutions are solutions towards equity. So again, I just wanna end with this one really important concept. Whoever you are and whoever, whoever you're talking to is, you and they are already the perfect person to care. And our job, as people who care and who are activated is to figure out what door brings them in to this issue. What do they already care about that they're already passionate about that would make them the perfect person to advocate for climate solutions? And what are some concrete climate solutions at the local scale or the regional scale that they could advocate for or even implement in their own lives or in the organization that they're part of? Thank you so much for having me. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, really fantastic presentation. Again, this will be recorded and posted on our uh, YouTube site. Uh, stick with us for future talks. Uh, we'll see you next Wednesday with the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity.